welcome to New Game Plots. I'm Tim. I'm joined by Donald. How are you? I am preparing my lack of sleep face for Electronic Entertainment Expo, which should be coming next week. Yes, very exciting. We get to see all the news from the big publishers, yeah. developers, as well as the PC gaming press conference, which uh, um, well, debuted we, last year. We, well, you mean you say C, but none of us are actually going to watch it now, are we? Yeah, that's true. Uh, there is lots of streams, oh, though. Oh, it's not so sincerely. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, the PC gaming press conference was terrible oh, last year. Oh, yes. God awful. So hopefully they uh, improve on it this year. <laughs> no, I'll just rely on everyone else. It's like, it looks like it's going to be a big year of console announcement, but sort of half-step console announcements, yes. announcements with the rumours of the Xbox Slim and the PS4 Neo. The VR console upgrade yeah. announcements. So yeah. uh, things that play well with the Morpheus and uh, PlayStation VR as well as other... Uh, are they VRs on the market? I'm actually curious as to whether the major publishers will bring any VR projects because now that they've had chance to uh, play around with the retail versions of the Oculus and the HTC Vive, that they've started to... Uh, they would have been working on prototypes for the longest of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah but but uh, we're certainly going to see a lot in the PC space for that, um, especially when it comes to hardware manufacturers. Yeah. We just had uh, NVIDIA announce their new graphics cards. Uh, we might see something from AMD to really look at this 4K gaming slash VR uh, push towards the future. Meanwhile, on the game side, we're, we've heard rumours of Watch Dogs 2 being a thing. We'll see more from The Last Guardian, some of the games that got announced at last year's E3, so like ReCore and Horizon Zero Dawn. We'll see No Man's Sky, which has just been delayed for another month or so. We'll hopefully see a burnout game. Maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> we'll hopefully see Beyond Good and Evil 2. We won't, but I, I hold out hope every year. But speaking of fantastic games, we do have some later on in the episode. Yeah. We'll look at Overwatch. We also look at the promise that may be the Nintendo NX. But first up, let's go into Digimon. So Shane, we're in the year 2016. 2016? Why is Digimon a thing now? Digimon a thing is a thing because I think last year was the 20th anniversary, 25th, I can't even remember. Why are you making me feel old? I don't know. We are all old because I still remember like the original Digimon stories. It was just amazing. Okay, but, okay, okay. But it is 2016 right. and we've got an English release of Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth. So this was a game that was originally released like 2013 in Japan. Yeah. It was originally a Vita game and yep. then thanks to a big fan, a big fan petition, mm -hmm. we actually got it. That said, it may not sell well in America just because there's no English track. Okay. But that's the thing. Do, do we need it? No, we don't. Because this game is a lot of fun. It's, I guess, the Digimon game that we've all been waiting for. It's missing a few elements, but it's got the core elements of a Digimon game. Basically, you know, starting fights, slightly grinding a little bit. Digivolving to many different mechanical or non-mechanical creatures because, you know, it's Digimon. Right. And it's got that story element and the grindiness that you kind of want. But it just falls a little bit... I, I, playing it on a PlayStation 4, it just falls a little bit just because I feel like I should be actually playing it on a handheld. Well, there is a Vita option available as well. There is, but playing it sitting down, I'm just, I feel like I'm just missing something. But that said, there's a lot to this game that I really enjoyed. The music is very, very nice. Okay. Yep. The visuals are very, very nice too. Mm -hmm. If even for a game that came from, I guess, a Vita to the PS4, it's surprisingly nice. The combat system's basic at its core, but it's got an auto mode that just makes grinding so much easier. I mean, like, I don't realize why, why all games have don't have an auto mode. It just doesn't make sense. Fair enough. But that said, it's one of those games that if you are a Digimon fan, you probably already have picked it up and you're probably already having fun with this game. If you're not, pick up this game. Have fun with this game, because you will. What he said. There's a lot of, I guess, disappointments in games that have a lot of universes converging into one. Mm -hmm. There was Project X Zone, which was like the original of this game. It just felt empty. The game had no real soul to it. There was a lot of fan service, but nothing really came of it either. But the fan service was pretty good, that's why I'm so thirsty. Well, you've still got 
Project Exone 2 to catch up for your thirst. Yep. Now, the English translation for this game is actually quite interesting. There are actually more geeky jokes in the English translation than in the Japanese. Well, I guess, like, that's the, I guess, them playing with the freedom, I guess, that you can yeah, have with, like, translations. Fa mm, fairly we, liberal translation. But the main issues with the old game were just basically the gameplay was just oh, yeah. boring, open, wide areas that you basically knew where the reinforcements were coming. You couldn't really do anything about it. And the grind was just so boring that there was not even any purpose to it. Mm. It's, it? As a strategy game, it's uh, it, like if you've played any other strategy games, this is like, eh. but as a combo simulator, this is not too bad. So it's basically Marvel versus Capcom, but PV, like it's player <laughs> versus bots instead of player versus player. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. Yeah, but uh, except that, like, you know, it's one of those things where, like, oh, am I going to drop this combo and lose half my damage? Uh. So, no, it, that is actually fucking wrong. Oh, God. Oh, wait, no, is. But... Yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. No, but, like, at least with the other one, there was... Uh, I guess the merging of the universes was something that was interesting, something that wasn't 100% done very often, but coming into the second one, what, only two, three years later, it's more of the same. It's more of the same, so there's nothing yeah. really different. Do we even get like, you know... Oh wait, we get Reiju and Xiaomu from uh, Namco Cross Capcom back. Oh, okay, so we get... So returning characters. Returning characters, we get like... But we've lost Valkyrie Chronicles characters. Mm. Oh. Do we even get like any good fan service? Like, the last one had alright fan service, but... Anything? Well, there's a... Uh, if you complete level 36 on your second playthrough... Second playthrough. You get a hot spring scene. Is, but... that, is that even going to be worth it? I don't know. Who, who could be bothered to do that? Nintendo announced that its upcoming console, the Nintendo NX, will be coming out in March 2017. We didn't find out about this through a Nintendo Direct with Shigeru Miyamoto spelling out there with Pikmin dolls. We didn't find out about it through a live stream extravaganza with Reggie just going on stage yelling, March! 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 And then announcing the date. No, we found out about it through an investor presentation, hidden between the operating profits and number of high fives of the vicinity. Like that one for instance. We don't even know what the NX is to this day, unless they renounce it between my filming of this and the airing of this episode. So it could be a hybrid home and handheld console, it could be a VR headset, or given Nintendo's recent move to also sell the chairs in the Seattle Mariners baseball team, it could mark their move into the much more lucrative field of basketball, with the consequential purchase and renaming of the New York NEX. What we do know is that it effectively marks the death knell of the Wii U, which by the time the NX is projected to come out will have only been out for just over four years. You can count its lifespan on a single power glove wielding hand. And yes, I have to apologize for that reference. It's so bad. Oh, thank you. And I don't envy anyone who purchased a Wii U in the past year or so with the expectation that it would last at least another 2-3 years. Especially after such a bumper 2015 with Super Mario Maker, Splatoon and the true breakout hit, the Amiibo. Bulk all you want, but just by mentioning the word Amiibo, I have to buy one mid-sentence, mid-segment. But what do Wii U units have to look forward to between now and March 2017? There's about 17 major games to come out for the console, such as the new Paper Mario game, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, Gymnastics, Athletics, and the 13 other mini games that make up Mario and Sonic at the 2016 Rio Olympics. And it's not like they even have a big back catalogue they can go into either. If you look at the highest rated Wii U games on Metacritic, at number 6 is Mario Kart 8. DLC Pack 2 it actually rates four places higher than the real Mario Kart 8 game. Now I understand why Luigi is looking so damn angry. But although Wii U owners have been left to dry, and it is a shame that they have, it's still kind of heartening that given Nintendo's recent attitude, this is an exception rather than the expectation. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's go back to 2006 for a second. The Nintendo DS was printing money and everyone was playing Wii Tennis, from the elderly to the retired to the seniors. It was about this time that Nintendo started to lose touch with the community that had grown up with Mario and Kirby and whatever the hell this is. That started making some uh, decisions that felt off base, like the balance board, and for a hot second they almost thought that we would all buy Vitality Sensors. 
Although here in 2016, everyone's wearing fitness trackers, so maybe they were ahead of the curve on that one. But this arrogance carried into the early days of the Wii U, and it was at its worst in 2013. The EVO fighting tournament was set to feature Super Smash Bros. for the first time. Until that is, Nintendo tried to stop the whole thing. Although after an impassioned plea from the community, Nintendo relented and the people were allowed to smash once more. Yes, it is basically the plot to Footloose. This story even has some dancing in it. Dance trotting is basically fox trotting, but dashing in opposite directions. Dance trotting is similar to dash dancing in Melee, which allowed you to mind game your opponent while also being able to transition into attacks whenever opportunities presented. Since this time, Nintendo have definitely become better. Their games are as good as they've ever been, matching innovation with nostalgia. And we all flock to watch Nintendo Direct, which is almost as strange as looking forward to the commercials, except for the fact that they are delivered with such charm and folksiness. And they've even embraced the fighting game community that they so scorned only three years ago, hosting world-class world Smash on their big major stage. They've even gone so far as to preserve face with the FGC by rubbing it in endless salt. Reggie, for being the president of Nintendo, you suck at Smash Bros. Oh. Whoa! So I spend 16 hours a day running a company. John. You spend 16 hours a day playing Smash, oh. so... You could almost tell that Reggie meant that insult sincerely. But in the Wii U's short, short lifespan, Nintendo has rediscovered its sense of wonder. It's connected with community. And so I honestly hope that the NX reflects this. Or I could be completely wrong and it just ends up being a GameCube st strapped to a balance board. Or it ends up just being a glove with the word synergy on it attached to a pole. And that is everything that has happened in the world, ever. and welcome to Planeswalker Plus. This week, we are going to be playing Shadows of Innistrad in the sealed format. It's going to be Shane and me helped by the lovely Elias because I didn't want to play against him because he's too good. And I get to choose that because I'm in charge. Let's go see what it's like. So Elias. Tell us about Shadows of Innistrad. What are the key things we should be looking out for? Okay, so one of the most exciting things about this set is that it marks the return of double-faced cards, yeah. which transform into new and exciting creatures. We have a bunch of different werewolves, vampires, mm -hmm. and human tribes throughout the set, and we also have a lot of exciting new mechanics to look at as well. Cool. How does the sealed format work? Okay, so each person is given six boosters. You open these boosters and they become what is called your pool. Ooh. You then use these cards to build a 40 card minimum deck, yep. and you can use that to battle for the rest of the day. Wonderful fun. So it's, you have more choice than in a draft, but can't be quite as choosy. Yeah, so unlike a draft, you don't get as synergistic as a deck, but you're the, the constraint of the cards within your pool really pushes you to really some creative outlets within the deck building. Great, so what kind of cards should I be looking for? What do I need? to beat Shane, aside from showing up? Okay, so as I mentioned before, the double face cards have been pushed to be quite powerful within this set. Yeah. Uh, if you do get them to transform, then they uh, have an additional effect, like they might grant the rest of your creatures trample, or something else of that nature, just to kind of really get the game swinging in your, in your direction. Yep. Uh, the other thing is that there is a lack of a lot of really strong removal, mm -hmm. so that means that battling for the board is gonna be a lot more important than ever. Interesting. Okay, well, let's go play. So I've sorted my pool into colours. What do I do next? Alright, so now what you want to be doing is you want to be looking at maybe two colours that you want to focus on. Yep. Start looking for cards that seem powerful or that you want to play with yep. and that might pull you into two of those colours. And then start looking for synergies within those colours. Uh, it's definitely a two-colour format, so you, may able, so you might want to stick to that. Mm -hmm. But after that, put together a decent curve and you're good to go. Cool, look forward to it. I'm playing a black-white creature deck. Uh, it's very, very creature heavy. Uh, probably my best card is the Westvale Abbey. 
which is a land until I do a bunch of stuff and suddenly it's a demon. Mwahaha. So I'm playing Red Blue Tempo, which I'm not 100% sure how well it's going to match up, especially against a, like, a very strong creature deck. But my favourite card is probably the Henwyr Militia Captain. Uh, not just because he's white and sparkly, but because he eventually turns into a cleric, which can be ridiculously massive. I'm hoping that at least I get one win. I'm not only a fan of massive clerics, but this guy seems like he could be good. Thanks to terrible advice from Elias and a really lucky opening hand from Shane and my terrible hand, Shane somehow won. Yeah, we don't get it. Maybe suggest some ways I think there was magic involved, but not the good kind. Anyway, tune in next time for more magic, more fun, more laughter, and more us making fun of Shane. See you then. Good life is best described using simple words. Honor, wisdom, valor. The virtues we cultivate were bestowed upon us. They became a code, our code. Some say we strayed from the path of virtue and a god sent the beast to teach us a lesson. I say we simply hire a beast slayer. Don't let them fool you into thinking it's just another contract. This land has never seen such unspeakable evil. of love and wine. Exactly how I remembered it. Another trailer reaction, another trailer with horrible, horrible music. Come on, are we still in the 2000s here? Are we all year eight people listening to broody, shitty new metal? Thankfully, that music isn't in the actual game. They oh, actually have that. an awesome soundtrack. <laughs> as always, the Witcher games have fantastic sound and gorgeous visuals, of oh, course. Of course. Um, this new expansion, Blood and Wine, is going to be almost as big as the, the original game because the, uh, the area itself is as big as Velen and a whole heap of new quests, a whole heap of new uh, weapons, Creatures that you can fight. I am so looking forward to it. Like, are they indicated of whether they're going to like hit the same moral quandaries that they did with, say, the Bloody Baron quest, the quest that everyone loved out of the main Witcher Three game? They, they will still have those uh, very important decisions that you yeah. need to make. And uh, as with a lot of the side quests in Witcher Three as well, they have well uh, quests that really affect you and your decision making because even in the main game there weren't main quests that really brought on those feelings but side quests as well that was fantastic now here's the most important question tim for you and the viewer what new Gwent cards are they going to have in this one? Well, if you get the physical version, uh, you get the Northern Realms deck and the uh, Nilfgaard deck as well. So you got the first two decks from the previous expansion, but now you can play all the decks with physical Gwent cards. Yeah. I hope that it also comes with some earmuffs to block out the horrible, horrible trailer music. Now, Shaney, I had the time of my life when I was a little girl playing Team Fortress 2. What about you? It was, you know, a bad time, but let's not go there. So instead, what we're going to be doing is looking at a game that relives those cherished memories. We are, we are, we're back in 2007 once again. Instead of Team yeah. Fortress 2, it's Overwatch. And we're back into objective gaming. It's very much a team-based game. You get to onto an objective, you shoot your enemies, then you either A, get to another objective and stand on the objective, or B, 
move a package slash thing, tank, truck, whatever you want to call it, so yes, to an actual another place. So it, it's very much a team-based game. Team-based objective combat uh, featuring a massive, a huge roster of, uh, of mm. players as well, each with their own abilities and their different roles. So you have attack, defense, tank, support, all have a very important role to play when it comes to uh, healing healing your, uh, your, your, uh, your friends, your comrades, uh, resurrecting them, taking the brunt of damage, or just dealing a crap load of damage. That's, I guess, where the issues with the game is comes from. Because there's actually not that much of a tutorial, there is a little bit here and then there's just a map that you can just te farm, you know, test a few abilities and stuff. There isn't that much teaching of, I guess, team play or objective gaming. It's very much gives you, I guess, the small like controls, it throws you into the game, and then it goes like, oh, well, um, I guess you know how to play the game. Mm -hmm. Go play with a team. Safe to say that if, if you haven't played something like Team Fortress 2 or Quake um, over the past few years, you're probably going to have a bit of a hard time just kind of grasping the, uh, the nuances of a shooter. Yeah, because it's very much a team-based game. You are not going to be having fun if you're solo queuing. You're not going to be having much fun if you're solo manning. You're mm -hmm. trying to run into a, like a 1v6 team. Even if you've got like a McCree ult or a Reaper ult or something like that, mm -hmm. you still have to work as a team. Yep. It, you get shut down very, very easily when you're versing a team that is a team. Speaking of which, if we're going to be a bit nitpicky as well, I mean, the game looks fantastic, sounds great, the art design is incredible, yeah. but one thing I'm having a bit of issues with in particular is that unless you are on Skype, on Discord, uh, with a full team, with your team composition and constant communication, you're going to have a very hard time having fun while solo queuing. There is in-game communication, which does work sometimes, but sometimes it's a little bit iffy, it's just drops out sometimes and a bit crackly. If you do have a team and if you do, I guess, play as a group, very much use those other side third party like communications because they work just a little bit better that it's worthwhile. And the other thing I'd have to bring up is just, I say, the lack of content. There's enough maps, they're all balanced and everyone else is, I guess, as balanced as they really could be. Mm -hmm. But there is just that. There's no like competitive play yet. It's coming in in a month. I don't know why it there didn't are, release. There are guaranteed some heroes and a few maps a little bit later on, but like I said, they're not there yet. They're not there yet, and it's just, I guess, the lack of content at the mm -hmm. moment. And I guess even the lack of uproar for the content. When uh, something like Street Fighter V got the massive uproar for, what, small single-player survival mode and versus, when this has just got one of those three. Yep. Well, despite that, I, I, I'm, I'm having a time of my life with Overwatch at the moment. I mean, I mean, sure, I'd love to see what it has in store yeah. a little bit later on, but... Like I said, you've said your piece, haven't you? It's fun, it's just, I think there needs to be more. Now the actual in-game community might not be the best, according to Shane in our review, but the actual community that spawned outside of that game is just something to behold, ain't it? Yes, uh, it's had very good traction with uh, the community, especially Blizzard community. Yeah. A lot of the casuals that have been getting onto Hearthstone... Uh, I'm sorry, what stone? Hearthstone. Hearth is that like Hearthstone? I believe it is. Same, yeah. same, same thing. Um, have been getting into this game, and maybe it's their first first person shooter as well. Mm. So there is that entry barrier of maybe not getting the most skillful teammates. Which would it certainly explains the first week of public matchmaking. That's yes. for sure. Yes, but I think once everyone starts getting into it, uh, it, it is certainly a lot of fun. And I've played with a couple of people uh, with a few randoms on yeah. the team, and it seems to work quite well. Yeah, it's like we're playing the game now about two weeks after its initial release. Yeah, like it's it's, it's certainly shaken now for sure. I'm very interested to see how the hardcore pro community are going to find the game once ma once uh, ranked matchmaking comes into the air. It's very interesting because uh, Australia is actually picking up as one of the bigger scenes for esports in in Overwatch. So it'll be interesting because there's a lot of depth to the game in that you can change out your characters all the time and implement a lot of strategies. So what, just so, have, like someone just have just a team captain go, go, go Falcon strategy, go, and then everyone just switches to McCree or yes, whatever? Yes, something like that. So it, it can really be very entertaining to watch in that sense. You, well, you well, definitely need a microphone on them live for that moment, so, don't you? So seeing the balance of the game moving forward as yeah. well as additional maps and game modes coming in, the future for Overwatch looks bright. I'm just glad that it's not the MMO Project Titan it was going to originally be. <laughs> I just look forward to seeing more combinations of Overwatch and Tommy Wiseau from the room. Yes, and combinations of DC animated footage as well. Um, 
That's it for this week. Do visit our website, www.newgameplus.tv. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash newgameplustv. Follow like Twitter and Instagram at newgameplustv. And subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitch. We are newgameplustv. One word, no spaces. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Tim. We'll see you guys next week.